It's a great pleasure to introduce today's speakers, Tracy Putotsky, to you. Um, Tracy has uh, joined my lab at the Ludwig Institute in 2006 after she had written to me 18 months earlier that she would be quite interesting, interested in uh, doing a, a postdoc with me. And I was, of course, extremely flattened that a Canadian scientist would approach me. Um, it was a little bit of a problem, though, because um, the PhD project or thesis she said she was working on didn't seem to be quite relating to the major interest of, of my group. Indeed, she was working on a study to um, explore the efficacy of organ cultures to examine wood formation in Pinus radiata, which she did at the University of Canterbury. But I have to say, I never regretted for a moment um, Tracy joining the lab. And I guess within a year or less, she really had caught up with the literature to the extent that she quite um, happily was challenging um, my sometimes naive concepts of the roles of cytokines in, in, in tumor promotion. But I think the real breakthrough um, for Tracy came when um, the two of us went to a VHI seminar, I think it was in 2010, that uh, Brent McKenzie gave, who um, then just came back um, from the US to, to join CSL, and alerted us of the fact that CSL had antagonists against interleukin-11, and more to the point that, in fact, they didn't really quite know what to do with it. So that really gave um, Tracy a fantastic opportunity to um, try to explore in a therapeutic concept the, um, the data that she had already generated, um, I guess, in a genetic um, setting. Now, Tracy is really a, a very bright and, and motivated and talented young um, scientist, but she's also a very strong advocate for um, young females in, in science. And this is really something that hasn't gone um, unnoticed. So, for instance, the Cass Foundation uh, chose to put her face on the banners. They flew through the streets of Sydney when they had a fundraiser uh, a few years ago. And, and also our director, I believe, um, after a late Friday um, post a cheese and wine um, um, session at the Law and Cancer Conference. Um, in my presence, notably, um, asked Tracy whether she ever had thought about uh, becoming a lab head um, at the VHI. So two years later, and, and literally 10 days before Tracy is going to move down from the fifth floor to the third floor to run her own group in the inflammation division, um, I guess this um, concept really has come through, and we wish you all the, the very best. So Trace is going to tell us about the rather unsuspected role of a cytokine that has been around for at least 25 years, and in fact, the um, cytokine or the signaling of that cytokine has had quite a, a, an intimate um, relationship um, with VHI. So Tracy, with any further ado, um, please tell us about the background that has led to your um, cancer cell paper that came out earlier last week. Thank you. So I assure you that um, even though I do get bored in science quite often, um, I don't intend to change fields again anytime soon. Um, so I'm going to tell you one of my favorite stories. Um, and the story really has its origins more than 100 years ago, um, when this gentleman made one of the first observations that um, when you had an infection, there was an induced inflammatory response. And at the same time, one of his arch nemesis is this gentleman, made the observation that if you had a cancer, there are often immune cells associated with those cancer cells. And it's really these two observations that are at the heart of current research into how the microenvironment around a tumor can promote the growth of the tumor. And it was in 2004, more than 100 years later, that Time magazine um, and the over-the-top way Americans do made the announcement to the world that inflammation was, in fact, a secret killer, and it was one of the components that promoted tumor growth. Now, for those of you not familiar with looking at cancer biopsies, these are colorectal cancer biopsies stained for beta-catenin. Now, beta-catenin is something we look for in the nucleus of cancer patients, and when um, there's a mutation in genes upstream of beta-catenin, um, beta-catenin becomes nuclearized. So this tells us that there's a barrent activation of the Wnt signaling pathway and potentially mutations in the APC protein in this patient. And what you can see in this patient is even though we know they have potential mutations in their um, genes, we see quite a few inflammatory cells around the tumor. So the question, of course, you might ask is why did it take us over 100 years to start looking at why these immune cells were surrounding the tumor cells? And I think that's really because um, scientists um, tend to follow trends, and we tend to set trends. And it was really these two gentlemen who first made the observation um, of retroviral oncogenes and started describing proto-oncogenes, along with the work of um, Bert Vogelstein that really distracted us for a little while. 
And what Vogelstein proposed in colorectal cancer in the 1990s was that there's a series of mutations that occur over the progression of the disease. Now we refer to this daily in the cancer research world, especially in colorectal cancer, and when we update what we know about this pathway over time. Um, so the new focus um, at the moment and some of the new trends are in stem cells in this pathway. So stem cells are cells that sit at the base of CRIPS in colorectal cancers. They acquire mutations, they divide, they produce daughter cells that then carry these mutations out through the tumor. Um, the trend that I prefer to follow is that of the microenvironment, and that's really at looking at what these cells around the tumor um, are doing to help the tumor to grow. So it wasn't until 2011 that Hanahan and Weinberg added tumor-promoting inflammation to what we refer to as the hallmarks of cancer. And for those that don't work under cancer, this is really an umbrella um, term that we use to describe a lot of the features that tumor cells acquire um, to allow them to survive. So there are really two types of cancers that drove um, what we understand about the role of inflammation in cancer, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about them today. The first is colitis-associated cancers. So patients that suffer from inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis, depending on the duration of the disease, the severity of the disease, or underlying environmental and genetic factors, are predisposed to acquiring uh, mutations, or perhaps have already underlying mutations, and have an increased risk of developing colorectal cancers. The second is intestinal type gastric cancer, and this is really where the infection and inflammation and cancer link comes together. And we know that Helicobacter pylori, a gram-negative bacterium, can colonize the gastric mucosa of patients, um, leading to the stepwise progression of disease that we refer to as the chorea sequence. So these patients' intestinal mucosa, or gastric mucosa, takes on an intestinal phenotype and leads to an adenoma. And while we appreciate the sequence of events, we don't fully understand the genetic um, events linked to this disease. So how does this relate to Australia? Well, IBD is one of the most prevalent diseases in Australia. It affects one in a thousand Australians. Even though it's easily diagnosed, and even though there are treatment options, um, recurrent disease is a problem. And in particular for these patients, the increased risk of developing colorectal cancer. Now, colon cancer is the second most common cancer in Australia, and the statistics are quite scary. Um, if you look around the room at the moment, if we're predicting that 1 in 10 and 1 in 14 women will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer by 85, and that's quite a few of our colleagues who may suffer from this disease. And although Australia has been um, very good at introducing screening programs, we're still short on treatment options for advanced stage disease. Now, gastric cancer is the fourth most common cancer worldwide, the second most common cause of cancer-related death. While it's not as prevalent in Australia, it's quite a devastating disease because it's asymptomatic for quite a long time. So by the time the disease is diagnosed, it's quite a late-stage disease, and one of the main um, treatment options is removal of your stomach. So IBD, colorectal cancer, and intestinal-type gastric cancer do have some unifying features. Um, I find the gastrointestinal tract quite amazing. There's one single layer of epithelial cells that needs to keep these luminal antigens away from your underlying um, inflammatory cells. And in a normal situation, if you had an infection or a little bit of damage, <coughs> these epithelial, excuse me, <coughs> these epithelial cells and immune cells should cooperate to repair that wound. And in some situations, if there's an underlying genetic mutation or something goes wrong, these cells can then promote the growth of the tumor. And so when we look at the tumor microenvironment, and we're trying to do two things, we're trying to understand how the microenvironment can promote tumor growth, and at the same time we're looking at um, the microenvironment as a new option for therapeutics. So can we therapeutically target these cells or the things these cells are producing in the microenvironment to prevent the progression of a tumor? Now I asked Andrew Roberts if I could borrow a slide from him, and one of the first talks I saw at WEHI was one of Andrew's um, talks about how you would develop a new therapeutic. Um, so I'm going to call these the Andrew Roberts keys um, to developing a new therapy. And the first I'd like to introduce you to is the signal transducer and activator of STAT3. And what I'd like to do is introduce you to why I believe it's a legitimate target for a number of types of cancers, what its function is within those cancers, and what the consequences of inhibiting or activating this transcription factor can be. So STAT3 can be activated by a number of ways, either by growth factors cytokines or a number of kinases, and when the STAT3 um, upstream signaling components come together, JAKs can then phosphorylate STATs. Once STATs are phosphorylated, they can form active dimers through reciprocal interactions. This allows them to translocate into the nucleus, where they can then regulate downstream target genes. 
And amongst these are all the things that we consider as part of the hallmarks of cancer. So an increase in proliferation, the ability to migrate, the ability to produce blood vessels, which are really the food source of the tumors, and the ability to evade the immune response to the anti-tumor immune response. So when we talk about elevated STAT3 and in all the images that I show you today, we're really going to talk about phosphorylated STAT3, which is these active dimers that get into the nucleus to regulate gene transcription. So when I first started in um, the Ernst lab, we used to say that there were no mutations in STAT3 and that we didn't know what was upregulating the activation of STAT3. And we know that that's no longer true. Um, Hyper-IgE syndrome, as we heard from Stuart Tangy a couple of weeks ago, has a number of mutations in STAT3. Most of these mutations tend to be dominant negative um, mutations. Whereas we now know in hepatocellular carcinoma, in a small percentage of these cells, they have activating mutations for STAT3, as well as large granular lymphocytic leukemia. And so when I was preparing this talk, I thought I pr should probably check to see whether there's mutations in STAT3 before I told you there are none in colorectal cancer. Um, and Dimitri very kindly went through um, some of the data that we had in-house from the Ludwig. Um, and indeed, there are some mutations in STAT3 in colorectal cancer. Now, there aren't a lot of mutations in STAT3. If you go through the Cancer Gene Atlas, STAT3 mutations are relatively rare. So rather than saying there are no mutations in STAT3, um, instead I'm going to say that the mutations are relatively rare. Um, instead, we're going to focus on how else STAT3 can be activated and what the consequences of activating STAT3 are. So there are two models that I'm going to introduce to you throughout the talk, and both of them relate to the human diseases that I showed you before. So if we induce colon tumors in a mouse, and this is a Swiss roll of a, co of a colon, so this is the skin around the um, bottom end of the mouse, the distal colon, the middle colon, out to the proximal colon, and you can see the tumors form in different regions of the colon. In essentially a wild-type mouse, we can induce the formation of tumors, if we remove STAT3 specifically in the epithelial cells of the mice, we get a significant reduction in tumor formation. And if we use a mouse that has a systemic um, activation of STAT3, you can see we have enhanced tumorigenesis. So STAT3 has a significant role in colitis-associated cancers, at least in the mouse. And intestinal-type gastric cancers, and these are pictures of the stomach cut along the greater curvature and splayed open so that the lumen um, is facing you. You can see in this mouse with systemic STAT3 hyperactivation, we have gastric adenomas forming that um, mimic intestinal type gastric cancer. If we remove one STAT3 allele, we can limit um, the formation of these tumors. And if we treat the animals with STAT3 antisense oligonucleotides, we can um, reduce the tumors in these animals. So um, we and others showed in these and quite a few other models that STAT3 had quite a significant role in the progression of tumors. And that led to the development of quite a few antagonists that have gone into clinical trials. Um, this is a snapshot of what was in clinical trials as of the weekend. Um, this STAT3 decoy um, has completed its trial. Um, it's recently just failed because it's not stable in xenograft models. These um, two antisense oligonucleotides are getting quite a bit of press time um, at the moment. These have shown to be um, efficacious in quite a few different cancers. And this small molecule, they're not quite sure specifically what it's hitting in STAT3. Now, um, while it's great that these molecules have gone into clinical trials, we know from our mouse studies that if you knock out STAT3, it's embryonic lethal. So it has quite a few different roles. Um, Antisense oligonucleotides as well need to be quite specific because STAT1 is quite similar to STAT3, and we don't want to take out the um, tumor immune surveillance. So I'm in the boat where I prefer to look at upstream cytokines to see if we can inhibit them um, and inhibit STAT3 um, since it's downstream. <coughs> So I'm going to talk quite a bit about the IL-6 family of cytokines. This family of cytokines shares um, GP130 um, beta subunit receptor as a common feature. Apart from IL-31, which is the newest member which uses the um, oncostatin M receptor. And I'd really like to focus on the IL-6 and IL-11. Now IL-6 has gained quite a bit of interest over the last five years. Um, for its significant role in tumor genesis. So if you inhibit IL-6, you can inhibit STAT3 activation. And we've seen quite a few papers come out on the different roles of IL-6, and this has led to the development of IL-6 neutralizing antibodies or antibodies against the receptor that are currently in clinical trials. Now, this is fantastic work for people in the cytokine field. Um, and just to take you through um, a bit IL-6 signaling, IL-6 ligand interacts with the membrane-bound alpha subunit receptor, which then interacts with the GP130 beta subunit, forming a hexameric complex, whereby we have two ligands, two alpha subunits, and two GP130 beta subunits. Now, IL-6 can also signal via trans-signaling, where there's a soluble form of the receptor. <coughs> 
Now this is important because the membrane-bound form is only on specific cell populations, whereas GP130 is ubiquitously expressed. So by having a soluble form, this bypasses the need for the cell to have the membrane-bound receptor and allows for signaling in any cell type with GP130. Now once this um, complex is formed, um, IL-6 can activate the ras erk signaling pathway, as well, um, JAX can phosphorylate um, tyrosine residues on the cytoplasmic tail of GP130, providing docking sites for STAT1 or STAT3, which, as I mentioned, form active reciprocal um, active dimers through reciprocal interactions and turn on many of those downstream target gene pathways. Now, where everyone has forgotten in this big rush to look at IL-6, um, oh, sorry, they're back up one moment, um, IL-6 has a downstream target gene SOX3, now, this is important for some of the mouse models I'll introduce you to because SOX3 is a negative physiological regulator of STAT3 activation. I'm um, going to interact with this tyrosine at position 757. So remember that tyrosine because I'll come back to it. Now, everyone has forgotten I'm um, in this big world of looking at IL-6 is that it has a near-identical twin, IL-11. Now, IL-11 also has a membrane-bound membrane form of the receptor. When it interacts with its ligand, it also forms a hexameric complex and can um, initiate downstream signaling of near-identical pathways. So IL-11 was discovered over 20 years ago. It was discovered as a soluble um, factor that could induce something that they thought could only happen in cells dependent on IL-6. So this was one of the first indications that these two cytokines might have redundant activities. We're not entirely clear on the expression source um, of IL-11. It's very difficult to detect in serum of healthy individuals. We know it's in the serum after viral-induced inflammation. It's present in the synovial fluid of arthritis patients, and also show you it's elevated in a number of different cancers. So we don't fully understand its function. We know that it's induced under different pathological stimuli. And just to drive home um, a point, if you look at PubMed, there are nearly 80,000 articles on interleukin-6, while there's less than 2,000 articles on interleukin-11. So it really is a forgotten cytokine. And if you have a look at everything that we know interleukin-6 can do, many of the same cell types can respond to interleukin-11. So B cells, epithelial cells, osteoclasts, macrophages, and then hematopoietic cells. Now, interleukin receptor has two transmembrane forms. There's no evidence of a soluble form yet, and I say yet because I have a, a separate project that I won't present today trying to determine if this is possible. The first isoform is expressed in a number of different cell types, and the knockout mass for this isoform was generated here at Wee High a number of years ago. The second isoform lacks a cytoplasmic tail. And what I find quite interesting in cancers is if we look at the expression of IL-6 receptor and IL-11 receptor, we see that they're co-expressed in quite a few different cell types, and in particular, they're present at the invasive front of the cancers. So we don't really understand a whole lot about how IL-11 signaling works. We've based everything that we know on IL-6, and we've just recently started to look to see if there are mutations in IL-11 signaling in colorectal cancer patients. And so far, we've found a few in IL-11, a few in the receptor, and a fair few in GP130. Um, so we're going to start looking at whether or not these mutations are significant to the function um, of IL-11. Now, that's quite difficult because no one's ever solved the crystal structure for IL-11. Everything is based on a low-resolution electron micrograph. Um, and just recently, we've solved the first structure for the IL-11 ligand. We can see that it's a stable um, alpha helical structure. And if I overlay it with IL-6, and for those of you that are structural biologists, you'll see straight away there's quite a few things that are a little bit different. Um, so we're going to start looking um, into how the structure and function of these two cytokines is related um, and how they're different. So. We're going to move into looking at IL-11 now as our therapeutic target in lieu of looking at STAT3. And what I'd like to take you through is why we think that IL-11 is a legitimate target, what its function seems to be in cancer cells, what the consequences of activating it or inhibiting it are, and whether or not these are dependent on certain types of cells. Now, if I take you back to the human disease, many, many people have published that IL-6 is elevated in a number of cancers, including colorectal cancers. Now, in this panel of um, non-tumor and tumor tissue that I have, I don't have a significant increase in IL-6 expression, but there definitely is a trend towards increase. But I always see an increase in IL-11 expression in tumor tissue compared to normal tissue. Now, if we take that a step further, when we look at STAT3 activation in tumor samples, and if we score tumors for low STAT3 activation, remembering that we're looking for that phosphorylated STAT3, or high STAT3 activation, and then repeat our gene expression analysis, 
We see that we don't really have a correlation between IL-6 and the level of STAT3 activation, but we do see in tumors that have high STAT3 activation, they most often have high IL-11 expression. So that led us to start looking at what IL-11 is doing in mouse models. And before I take you through a lot of the mouse work, I need to introduce you to the mouse endoscope. Um, now, this is something I set up at the Ludwig Institute. It took me a wee while to secure funding, and I need to thank CSL because they purchased the endoscope for us. Um, now, the endoscope has a 1.9 millimeter diameter. This is the end that goes into the animal. Um, it has an air pump. This is what I use to inflate the colon of the animal. It's actually meant to defog the camera. We have quite a powerful light source, and we have um, little doohickeys that allow us to control the camera. Now, there are only two of these in Australia. The other is in Perth, and there's about eight of these worldwide. And I'm sure you'll appreciate, um, as I go through the different um, data sets, um, the power that this really gives to some of our experiments. Now, this is the um, setup of the endoscope over at the Ludwig at the moment. Um, I anesthetize the animals with isoflurane. Um, this is Adele doing a beautiful job of endoscopy. We record our videos onto um, a, a computer, um, but CSL bought us a big screen TV so that we can see where we're driving. Um, this is the light source, and this is the camera um, for the endoscope. Now, I'll just show you a few videos so that you understand what I'm going to be um, presenting to you in terms of the data. These are the types of tumors that we can see. So as I look at the videos, I generally count the number of tumors and score them based on their size. So I'll be presenting quite a few endoscopy scores, and this is um, the tumor size and the tumor number taken into consideration. Now, just so that you don't think that that's um, an easy thing to do, and this is a second example of a mouse with quite a few tumors. I apologize if you get motion sick, but it can be quite difficult to drive around these animals. Um, they do clinch, so this is an animal that's clinching. Um, you can see it has quite a large tumor that we need to get around. Um, and we do try our best to get around them. We do have quite a few tricks. We don't want to perforate the colon of the animal. Um, and you'll see once we get past it um, that there are a few more tumors waiting on the other side. So it can be a technically challenging um, technique, um, but we do have it down now. Um, it takes us probably a minute or two per animal at the moment. And so you can see here there are a number of initiating tumors um, just past that main tumor. Now I'm often asked how good the resolution of the endoscope is. Um, you can see here the urethrocytes moving through the vasculature. Um, so we can see quite um, well with the endoscope. Um, this is just another example. Um, you can see the individual colonic crypts. Um, and if you watch down here, um, again, you can see the urethrocytes moving through the vasculature. OK, so moving on to our animal studies. Um, I'm quite big on proof of principle studies. Um, so the first thing I did was make sure that IL-6 and IL-11 can both signal through colonic epithelial cells if I was going to look at the role of IL-11 in the colon. Now you can see that both cytokines transiently activate STAT3 and to quite a similar extent. So we know the clonic epithelial cells respond to both cytokines. And if we look at the clonic tumors in wild-type animals, we can see that they have elevated STAT3 and they also have elevated IL-11. So we know IL-11 is overexpressed in the tumors of these mice. So I'm just going to introduce you to this colitis-associated cancer model that we use. Um, animals are injected with exoxymethane. This is a mutagen that they're given. Then they go through three cycles of um, dextran sulfate sodium in their drinking water. So this is a luminal irritant. So what we're doing is inducing inflammation and allowing for a recovery or wound, uh, wound healing phase. And then I can use the endoscope to monitor the formation of tumors in these animals. So the first thing that we did was compare IL-11 and IL-6 signaling. It had already been published that IL-6 had a role in this model. So we see after two cycles of DSS at this time point, that both wild-type and IL-6 knockout animals have tumors, whereas the IL-11 receptor knockouts don't. And now this is where the endoscope is quite important, because if I had been doing this experiment where I euthanized the animals, I may have concluded that these mice don't develop tumors at all. And we know that's not the case, because if we keep monitoring the animals, we see that eventually the IL-11 receptor knockout animals will start to develop tumors. So they're just significantly delayed. Um, what we do see is that we can repeat the data that's been published, that there is a significant decrease in tumor burden in IL-6 compared to wild-type mice, but this is much more striking for mice that lack the IL-11 receptor. So I should just point out that by taking out IL-6, we're taking out both classical and trans signaling. By taking out IL-11 receptor, we're taking out IL-11 signaling. Now this is just some examples of the types of still images that we obtain with the endoscope. So you can see the tumors that are formed in these animals. And if you look at the corresponding histology, what also became apparent was there's quite a bit of inflammation um, around the tumors in wild type and still in IL-6 knockout mice. Um, and this is nearly absent in the animals lacking IL-11 signaling. Mm 
So this was the first indication that there's a significant role for IL-11, much more significant than IL-6 in the colon. Of course, then we needed to start seeing what was happening when we lost IL-11 signaling. And what we can see in non-tumor compared to tumor tissue is we have a significant reduction in STAT3 activation in animals that don't have IL-11 signaling. And it was shocking to us that there was no significant reduction in STAT3 activation in the tumors in these animals. And what had previously been published was only the non-tumor adjacent tissue having a reduced STAT3 activation. What we didn't see, what we thought we might see, was a reduction in BCL2. So this is downstream STAT3 target and anti-apoptotic protein that we know has a significant role in tumors. We do see a reduction in the absence of IL-6. So this is one difference between these two signaling pathways. And if you put the two together, we seem to have a, um, a much more significant effect on BCL2. So the question then arose, which cells in the colon were responding to IL-11 to drive tumorigenesis? And to tackle this, we generated bone marrow chimeras. So we have um, wild-type donors into wild-type animals, IL-11 receptor knockout donors into wild-type animals. And you can see that when we lack IL-11 receptor in the bone marrow, we have no impact whatsoever on tumor burden in these animals. Whereas animals with wild-type bone marrow and an IL-11 receptor um, knockout background didn't develop tumors at all in this model. And this model was terminated a little bit earlier than the one I showed you earlier. So we know that the non-hematopoietic cells are responding to the tumor promoting IL-11. What else was quite striking was that in the absence of IL-11 receptor in the hematopoietic cells, these tumors still had a significant amount of um, inflammatory influx, whereas in the absence of IL-11 um, with wild-type hematopoietic cells and no IL-11 in the non-hematopoietic cells, we still had a significant reduction in the amount of inflammatory cells um, influxing into the colon. So we know that IL-11 has a role in an inflammation-associated cancer. So I next wanted to ask if there was a role in a cancer that was not initiated by inflammation. So we know now that even in people that don't have um, a tumor that's developed because of a, an inflammatory insult or infection, those tumors do still have inflammatory cells within them. Um, so I set out to set up a new model in our lab um, whereby mice were injected with this mutagen once a week over six weeks, and I monitored tumor burden over time. Now, at the end of this model, these tumors do have elevated IL-6 and IL-11. Now, there's quite a few genotypes here, so I'd like you to focus in on week 16. So at week 16, our wild-type animals haven't yet developed any tumors. But this GP130 animal, which has hyperactive STAT3, has a significant increase in tumor number and tumor burden. So this is a model in the absence of inflammation showing that STAT3 has a significant role. If we take away one STAT3 allele, we get a significant reduction in tumor burden. If we take away IL-6, we have no change in tumor burden in this model. But if we take away IL-11, we have a significant reduction in tumor burden. Again, if we look at the histology and the endoscopy, in the absence of IL-6, we still have a significant amount of inflammatory influx, whereas in the absence of STAT-3 and IL-11, we have a significant reduction in inflammatory cell influx. So we know that IL-11 has a role in colonic tumor genesis in the absence of the tumor initiating or the tumor promoting inflammation. And in case you didn't believe me, we have one further model. I'm um, using the APC min mouse. So this is a mouse that generates spontaneous um, tumors throughout the small and large intestine. If we take away IL-6, it had already been published that there is a significant reduction in tumor burden in these animals. If we take away IL-11, we have a significant reduction in tumor burden. Um, we have an even further significant reduction in tumor area if I was to show you those images. So there's three different models of human colorectal cancer demonstrating a significant role for IL-11, um, even more so than IL-6 in tumor progression. Um, and if you're not convinced, I do have seven or eight more models um, that I can show you um, later on. So we were quite excited about that. And I went back to our gastric cancer model because this is really the crux of the Ernst lab to start asking quite a few different questions. Now, I've mentioned this mouse quite a few times. This mouse has this tyrosine um, mutation, so there's a phenylalanine knock-in substitution that inhibits SOX3 from interacting. This inhibits the negative physiological um, role of STAT3, so we get hyperactivation of STAT3 in the presence of ligand. And when I had joined the lab, um, Thies and his postdoc at the time, Brendan Jenkins, had just made the observation that in these animals, in the absence of IL-6, um, the tumors were still there. So these are the stomachs with their gastric adenomas. And in the absence of IL-11, there was no tumor formation. So this was really the first indication that IL-6 was dispensable for tumor genesis, but not IL-11. And I really played off of these observations in my time in the lab. So the same proof of principle observations. 
If we stimulate animals with IL-11 compared to IL-6 and collect either antral tissue or the stomach polyps, we see a similar um, transient activation of STAT3. So this really tells us that in order for these tumors to form, there needs to be a continual supply of these cytokines to fire up STAT3. So we started looking at which cells made IL-6 and IL-11, and it's quite difficult when you work on an undercharacterized cytokine, so there's not a whole lot of reagents available to you. And we see that a lot of very similar cells produce IL-6 or IL-11. So we started wondering whether maybe they were activating quite different signaling pathways. And so Stefan team, a student in the lab at the time, um, undertook the task of doing a microarray analysis on mice that we had stimulated with IL-6 or IL-11 and comparing their gastric tumors. And as expected, uh, most of the downstream target genes were quite similar, but we did have a few that were a little bit different between the two. And we started wondering whether the ones for IL-6 tended to be a little bit more um, specific to immune cells, and the ones for IL-11 tended to be a bit more specific to epithelial cells. So we did a similar set of experiments where we started questioning the um, cells that required um, IL-11 receptor for tumors to form. Again, if we give bone marrow lacking IL-11 receptor to the animals, we still see tumor formation. Um, so again, we know that the non-hematopoietic cells are quite important for tumor formation to occur. Now, this doesn't mean that those um, hematopoietic cells aren't the source of IL-11. And if we start facts purifying different cell populations from these mice, looking at CD45 positive macrophages or epithelial cells, um, you can really see um, that CD45 positive cells make IL-11, as do the epithelial cells themselves. So we know a range of different cells can produce IL-11. We don't know which of these are the ones that are triggering the formation of the tumor yet. And so this was one of um, my favorite experiments um, in the lab. And this is where I really started to look to see if we could therapeutically inhibit IL-11. So I've already told you, um, and already knew from Brendan's work, that in the absence of IL-11 receptor, no gastric tumors would form in these animals. Um, and I started thinking to myself that if you're going to generate therapeutics, um, it's very unlikely that we're going to find something that's going to completely inhibit a signaling pathway. So I started looking at the heterozygote IL-11 receptor animals and aging them. And in my mind, if these animals had a significant reduction in tumor burden, then they were absolutely a suitable therapeutic target. And you can see in these GP130 mice, the gastric tumor burden increases with age. If we remove one STAT3 allele, we get a reduction in tumor burden because we know STAT3 is quite important for this pathway. And I was very happy to see that in the absence of one IL-11 allele, we get a significant reduction in tumor burden. Um, so this really told us that we could start developing therapeutics against this pathway and that this mouse model was a great model to test these therapeutics in. So um, we know that IL-11 is a, a significant therapeutic target. We know that if we inhibit it, we reduce tumor burden. Um, we're going to look, we've looked at some of the um, cells that require IL-11, so next we want to look at what happens if we develop a therapeutic. And so if we come back to the Andrew Roberts keys to developing a new therapy, we need to understand the drugs that we're going to use. And um, we're very lucky that CSL at the time had something called ML11 mutine. So this is really just a mutant version of the IL-11 ligand. It has a few mutations here and one down here. And this allows um, the mutine to bind to the IL-11 receptor with a higher affinity than the wild-type ligand. And in doing so, it inhibits activation of downstream STAT3. So we still have wild-type IL-11 being produced. It's just not able to signal because the receptor's been blocked up. So we first started looking at BAF cells that expressed um, IL-11 receptors specifically. And we could see in these cells that if we treated them with IL-11, we got a shift in STAT3 activation. And if we treated them with mutine, we inhibited STAT3. So we know that we can inhibit STAT3 with mutine. We can do this in a dose-dependent manner. So if we treat with IL-11, we get an increase in STAT3 activation, increase in concentrations of mutine, we decrease it. We could also see that in the presence of IL-11, we can increase the proliferation of these cells. And similarly, in the presence of mutine, we could decrease it. So we were quite happy that we had something that would hit the target that we wanted. The next step was to test it in the animals. And so I used the GP130 mouse model because it's quite a robust model. We know exactly how it behaves and how things should happen. And I treated the animals with mutine at three different time points. And these were meant to represent three different stages of tumor development. If I treated them for four weeks, what I could see is that each of the time points, regardless of the gender of the animal or their initial tumor burden, I had a significant reduction in tumor burden. And this was incredibly exciting to us. This was the first antagonist of IL-11 signaling shown to have a therapeutic benefit. You can see here these are the gastric adenomas, which are significantly reduced. And you can see that histologically. So this here is the antrum, the body, and the fundus of the stomach. So we were quite excited. We could therapeutically inhibit IL-11 signaling. Now we needed to understand what exactly the mutine was doing. 
And so if we treat over a shorter time course, we can see both in the antrum and the tumor tissue that we get a reduction in STAT3 activation, which is what we were hoping for. We also see in the tumor tissue that we get a significant reduction in the influx of inflammatory cells. It's looking at CD45 positive cells and F480 positive macrophages. And along with this, we see a significant reduction in some of our chemokines and some of our pro-inflammatory cytokines. And I picked on our one beta here because this cytokine is classically associated with intestinal type gastric cancer. So we know that IL-11 mutine can reduce STAT3 activation and can reduce inflammation. We wanted to know what else it could do. Um, classically, when we look at tumors, we look at their ability to proliferate and their ability to die. And in the presence of mutine, we saw a significant reduction in proliferating cells, looking at PCNA-positive cells, and an increase in cells undergoing apoptosis, looking at apoptag-positive cells. And this correlated with a reduction um, in cyclins and an induction in BIM. Now, as I mentioned in the colorectal cancer samples, we've never seen a reduction in the BCL2 family members, which is something that we were hoping for. Um, instead, we see an induction in BIM. And we're presuming that um, one of the mechanisms of mutine is to actually induce this um, pro-apoptotic um, protein BIM. Now, of course, one of the questions you ask when you work in therapeutic studies is, is your um, therapeutic curative? And if we treat animals with mutine over four weeks, so this is our control animal, our mutine-treated animal, we see the tumor burden reduction that we've seen previously. And if I take the animals off of mutine and allow them to age for four weeks, the tumors return. So we know that if we stop the therapeutic treatments, the tumors will return. And this tells us that at least in this model, that the tumors are addicted to IL-11 signaling. So we started to ask whether or not the mutine would work in other models. And we'll come back to the colitis-associated cancer model. This time you'll notice it's a little bit different um, because I know the tumors have already formed here by endoscopy and I want to monitor the response to the drug. What I can do with the endoscope is group, uh, group the animals um, into um, two groups that have very similar tumor burden and then I can monitor those tumors over the course of the therapeutic treatment. And you can see that we have a nice cytostatic effect with the IL-11 mutine treatment. So we get a significant reduction in tumor burden. Not all of the tumors respond. I'm quite comfortable um, with that notion. And we have a reduction in STAT3 activation, and again, this induction in BIM, quite similar to what we saw in the gastric cancer model. Um, but when I initially did these experiments, I did them in these GP130 mice, and I started wondering if what I was seeing was maybe specific to the GP130 mutation. And I started realizing the power of a wild-type animal. So we ran the model again, just using a wild-type animal, Keeping in mind that AOM induces random, um, is a random mutagen, so we don't know what types of mutations the tumors have. We know some of them will be KRAS, we know some of them will be beta-catenin. And if I treat those animals with mutine over time, again, I see this cytostatic effect on the tumors. We have a significant reduction in tumor burden, a reduction in the inflammation that we see in the tumor. Um, and again, we see the same reduction in STAT3 activation, induction of BIM, and reduction in cyclins. And this is actually probably one of my um, favorite therapeutic data sets because we were able to treat tumors in wild-type animals, and we assume the wild-type animals are as similar to us with random mutations. So if we come back to the Andrew Roberts um, keys to developing a new therapy, we have a drug that we believe hits our target. We think we understand its mechanism of action, but of course we still have more work to do. Um, and we know that it will stop working if you take it away. So we needed to test on what other side effects we might have from our drug. A lot of the STAT3 inhibitors and JAK inhibitors are failing in clinical trials because of the side effects, and particularly in platelet counts. Um, so I've shown you already that um, most of the literature out there on IL-11 is actually on the platelets. So um, IL-11 is an FDA-approved drug in the US to treat thrombocytopenia in chemotherapy patients. So we monitored platelets over a course of treatment, and we did quite a bit of dosing when we initially started working with um, the mutine. And we never saw a significant reduction in platelet number in these animals. We actually never saw any adverse side effects in these animals. So the final step in Andrew Roberts' key to developing a new therapy was to learn um, between the clinic and the lab. And of course, we're not there just yet, um, but I can tell you a little bit about what we know about how mutine might respond in human tumors. So MKN28 are gastric cancer cells. If you treat the cells with IL-11, you get an induction in STAT3 activation. If you treat with mutine, you get an inhibition of STAT3 activation. And one of the things we pay close attention to in human tumors is the idea of an invasive cancer. So if we do invasion assays and we treat the cells with IL-11, we get a significant induction in invasion. And if we treat them with IL-11 and mutine, this is blocked. And we see the exact same results for DLD1, which is a colorectal cancer cell line.
So of course, off the back of this, we moved into xenograft models. If we run the DLD1 cancer cells in xenografts and treat the animals with mutine from the time that the tumors are palpable, we see a significant reduction in tumor, tumor burden, and we also see a significant reduction in STAT3 activation. So we know that R11 can reduce tumor growth in a range of, um, inhibition of R11 can reduce tumor growth in a range of mouse models, um, as well as human cell line xenografts. So just to summarize a few of the different things I've shown you today, um, what I hope I've emphasized is that regardless of the underlying cause of the tumor, that cytokines can contribute to tumor progression. Hopefully I've also driven home the point that cytokines can be potential alternatives for therapeutic targets, especially when you have tricky um, transcription factors such as STAT3. Um, both inhibition of STAT3 and R11 have worked equally as well in our models, so I, of course, favor um, using R11 antagonists. And hopefully I've shown you that not all cytokines are equal. Um, I think, unfortunately, the world has gone down an IL-6 path because it's on multiplex assays and arrays. If you see an increase in IL-6 and increase in STAT3, it's very easy to conclude that that's the trigger and for the STAT3 activation. So we can't take anything at face value, even though um, at face value, things might look um, quite obvious. If you dig a little bit deeper, um, things can be quite different. Um, and I really need to thank Vanessa and Simon for making this illustration. It was our um, cover submission, which was unfortunately not accepted, and I think it's the, the journal's loss. Um, so where does that leave IL-11? Well, we have quite a few more questions than answers at the moment. Um, I'm quite interested in the evolutionary significance of having two closely related cytokines. Do we have them because they have different roles in different diseases? Do we have them because the body's just become lazy and has duplicated a few things? Um, we really need to start understanding which cells make the cytokines and which cells respond if we want to um, really approach this as a therapeutic option. And of course, off the back of the xenograft studies that I've shown you, I'm quite interested in seeing how these inhibitors respond in combination therapies. So that leaves me with the um, most important slide um, of my talk, and I'm going to start backwards to forwards. Um, I have been incredibly fortunate in the amount of um, funding that I've attracted from quite an early stage of my postdoc. CSL has been a fantastic support for this project, and as I mentioned, they purchased the most endoscope for us, um, which was really necessary to generate the type and quality of data that I have. Cure Cancer Australia was my first competitive grant. Um, they are an incredibly supportive foundation if you're ever fortunate enough to be supported by them. Off the back of that, um, I really was able to jump into the um, bigger funding games. Hopefully, I can continue to stay in those games. The CAS Foundation has been fantastic at giving me funding to set up a few different models um, and test a few questions that are maybe a little bit outside of the um, box. I've added a few of my mentors here. Um, this is a job that doesn't go into the job description but takes up quite a bit of our time. Um, Juliet's based overseas. She really helps me to find my way through the um, difficult parts um, of our careers. Kim said the um, four most um, influential words to me. Um, in my career, and I repeat those words to myself every now and then when I'm having a bad day. Um, Tony is an endless um, pool of support. Um, he knows everything about everything and always has time um, for you, so I'm really grateful to everything that they've done for me. Um, at CSL, apart from the um, financial help they've given, their scientists are pretty helpful and cool as well. Um, Brent and Nick have really been essential to this as well as a few other of my projects. Um, Kristen more recently, and some of the new generation antagonists that we have, and of course Andrew for letting it all happen. Um, Mike Griffin is the key structural biologist in all of the IL-11 work that I've presented to you today. Alex and Rita um, assist me with the human gastric cancer samples, and Florian and Paul, and I think Paul is actually in the audience today, um, have assisted with the human colorectal cancer samples. Um, a range of um, collaborators have helped with setting up different techniques and providing different reagents. Um, being involved with CSL is fantastic. It also means there's quite a bit of paperwork. Um, and I'm in debt to Cassandra and Carmela for sorting out the paperwork for me so that I could do the science end of things. Um, Lorraine, Philippe, and Andreas were my first collaborators within WeHi, and they've really paved the way to help me feel um, comfortable and like part of the team here. I know that you all know this, but Jason has been incredible because I'm not very good at keeping to nine to five. Um, he's been very flexible and helped me run through quite a significant number of bloods. Um, Irina and Ben helped with a few of the revisions for this manuscript. Um, they were incredibly calm and collective at a time that I was anything um, but calm and collected. 
Um, Oliver, Fiona, and Dimitri have helped quite a bit with the colorectal data that I've shown you today, and Dimitri in particular in pulling out those new mutations. Joan has always been a constant source of support, both in my personal and professional life, and I'm, I'm very grateful to her for that. Um, her group provided some of the human colorectal cancer um, samples that I've shown you today. David Siegel and David Wang are helping me set up what feels like to me quite a high throughput um, assay, but it's probably a standard day in tissue culture um, for them. All of Five West, I've worked my um, butt off to leave you since the day that I arrived, um, and you've never held it against me. Um, you've been incredibly supportive of everything that I've done, um, and I really look forward to collaborating with everyone in the future. Stefan generated a lot of the microarray data that I've shown you today. He was really my wall to bounce ideas off. Um, he's just moved back to Germany, and I'm going to miss him um, dearly. Andrea was the first RA that I had. Um, once you get an RA, everything starts moving incredibly quickly. Um, I really wouldn't have got this project off the ground at the momentum that I have without her assistance. Adele and Paul are my current team. Um, Andrea trained Adele, and Adele requires a very big and hopefully not too embarrassing thank you. She's really kept everything moving for me the last couple of years. We've had a rough year closing down an institute, moving into a new institute, dealing with paper rejections and revisions and everything that comes with that. Um, and she's really kept everything moving, and I know it wasn't easy at times, um, and I'm very grateful for that. And last but not least is Tis. Um, thank you for taking that risk when I first got in touch with you um, to join your lab. Thank you for never saying no to any of the ideas or anything that I ever wanted to chase, um, and always being incredibly supportive. Um, and I look forward to having you as one of my main collaborators in the future. And thank you to everyone else for listening. Thank you very much for a um, fantastic talk. Uh, I'm not sure whether you left a few questions open, but if they are, please ask Tracy. Chris. Um, Tracy, that was a great talk. Um, I recall um, some researchers at Cephalon um, published on a JAK1-2 inhibitor in, in a colitis um, model of colorectal cancer. Uh, how does that sit in with your data, um, what they report? So we've got elements for JAK at the moment using some JAK inhibitors and similar models, they do work. Um, I'm still um, in favor of upstream cytokines because the JAK inhibitors a lot that have gone into clinical trials have crashed out with quite a few side effects. Some of them neurological, some of them kill a lot of the blood cells that we now are, are quite dependent on the JAKs. So they do work. Um, of course, every possible therapeutic we can chase is, is a great idea, um, but I still favor going a bit further upstream of them. Very interesting work. You know, what, uh, where do you think the, the greatest uh, therapeutic advantages might be? What types of colorectal cancer? Or do you think all of them might be? Well, it, it seems from the mouse models that all of them. Um, it will do some work. I think what I love in is really is a bit of a, a help in wounding signal. So when the tumor comes and the body's trying to fight it off, um, it kind of hijacks IL-11 to promote its tumor growth. So the way I would see um, things working and what I'm hoping the um, combination studies will show me is if it can really control the tumor growth and you can come in with something else to kill off the tumor, um, and that way you can sort of better manage the tumors in, in patients. I don't think it's going to be the sale end all for the tumors by any means, um, but we do need some alternatives to help control at least the growth rate of tumors so we can hit them with other things. Is there yet um, an equivalent for human IL-11 or do these cross-react? So the, the mouse, the, what I've shown you is the mouse IL-11 mutant. It does cross-react, um, but of course working with CSL, they've generated quite a few different things um, that I'm not quite able to talk about just yet, um, but you can bet your bottom dollar one of them works in humans. So you uh, showed that mutine increases beam expression and beam knockouts. So we don't know yet. That's one of the things we want to do next. Um, so we've asked Philippe if we can use the BIM knockouts in the colitis-associated cancer model. Um, as well, I've talked to Delphine about using the um, breast cancer cells she has that have BIM knocked down because um, there is a role for L11 there as well. I didn't quite get how the new team works. Does it engage the re uh, receptor alpha that did not engage the G4? Well, so we don't really know without structure um, studies of that just yet. Um, where one of the key mutations is in the mutine is the bit of the receptor, or is the bit of the ligand we believe comes around and interacts with GP130, whereas the other mutations are in the bit that should interact with IL-11 receptor. So we've got the mutine in crystal trials at the moment, as well as the receptor protein. 
and the idea would be to chuck the two together um, and see what's going on. We can model it based on IL-6, but we know the dangers um, in some of that now, so until we have the actual structures, I'm hesitant to, to fully answer. Differential signaling on microarrays of IL-6 versus IL-11, um, do you think, is that, uh, I wasn't sure what our microarrays are, but uh, do you think there's a difference with the differential expression of the receptor Receptive. on different cells or different signals? So I, I would think that it's probably the receptor expression on the cells. So that was an array in whole tumours, and within those tumours there's quite a few different cells. And we have been critiqued um, on that at the time, that was how we set up the experiment. We do have a few future experiments looking at specific cell populations that we think have a role. Well, Trace, I think you did a fantastic piece of talk and answering 15 questions in five minutes. So uh, let's just 